Welcome to episode 158 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Garland Swikart, who served in the FBI for 33 years. In this episode, Garland reviews a case where he went undercover during a five-year sting targeting organized crime's influence over labor unions in the film industry. During the investigation, codenamed Dramex for Drama Exposé, Garland Swikart posed as Garland Huffner, an investment consultant for wealthy individuals who wanted to produce a non-union film. The case was later fictionalized as The Last Shot, an actual Hollywood feature film starring actor Alec Baldwin in the role of Garland Swikart. Matthew Broderick starred as the screenwriter-director, unaware that the producer was really an FBI agent and that his movie probably was never going to get made. During the early days of Garland Swikart's FBI career, he worked fugitives, bank robberies, and gambling cases in Detroit, Louisville, Houston, and Cincinnati. And he supervised the copyright squad in the Los Angeles division. He was also promoted to FBI headquarters twice, first as the supervisor and then later as the chief of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act unit, FOIPA. He eventually stepped down from management and was transferred back to the L.A. division, where he worked as a street agent on the labor racketeering and organized crime squad until he retired. This is such a fun interview. It involves the mob in Boston and making movies. This may be the most glamorous undercover assignment ever given to an agent. But before we get to the interview, I just have one thing to say, and that is hallelujah. Yes, I am done. I mean, really done with the writing and the revisions of my next book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a Manual for Armchair Detectives. Now, just because I'm done writing and revising doesn't mean it's done done. The next step is to have a few FBI agent beta readers look over it and then to get it to FBI headquarters. Every FBI employee must submit any books that they write about the FBI to headquarters for a pre-publication review. And that's always a hiccup. I don't believe there's anything sensitive in my book that will cause them to make any redactions, but I still have to wait for their review, and I have no idea how long that will take. My first two books took anywhere from 30 to 90 days While I'm waiting for them to get back to me, I will have the manuscript copy edited by a professional copy editor who works freelance for some of the biggest publishing houses in the country. She also worked on my first two books. And then I will have it proofread. Then I'll open it up to a select group of advanced readers to do an early read and help me launch the book with an honest review. I am so excited about myths and misconceptions. In each chapter, I discuss one of my top 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and provide a reality check while breaking down the facts. Throughout the book, I use quotes and snippets from some of the retired agents about how the real FBI works. I also review popular films and fiction featuring FBI agent characters. While you're waiting for the book to be published, why not join my reader team and get the FBI reality checklist to discover the top 20 FBI myths and misconceptions? You can join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com. Or if you're listening on a podcast app that supports links, you can join in the description of this episode. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Garland Swikart. Hi, Garland. How are you? 
I'm fine, Jerry. Thank you. The first thing I need to do is to give producer credit to Courtney, who is a friend of your daughter's. She emailed me and told me all about this case of yours that you did in the early 1990s, where you went undercover as a movie producer. And as soon as she started writing out, you know, why she thought that you should be on the show, I I was sold. I'm like, what? I never heard of this. That's when I reached out to you. So thank you so much for saying yes. You're welcome. So you went undercover as a movie producer. And then later on, as Hollywood, real Hollywood, heard about the case, they decided to make it into a movie called The Last Shot. Yes, um, starring Alec Baldwin, who played me, and Matthew Broderick, had uh, numerous individuals uh, that were in the case, Callista Flockhart, Joan Cusack, several other people playing different characters in the movie. A fellow named Shaloub. Oh, Tony Shaloub? Tony Shaloub, yes, he's in it. He played a mobster. And it went over very well. Disney, went through Brain of Vista, made the movie. But uh, you want me to tell you how this all began? Yes, we'll actually talk about the movie more at the very end. And I'd love to you know, have you tell us you know, what you thought about the movie and, and where they use creative license. But really, we're here to hear about the actual case. So where do you want to start with that? We'll start at the very beginning. I got transferred. I was working at FBI headquarters, and I got transferred out to Los Angeles as a street agent again. I was in a supervisory role at headquarters. And when I got there to Los Angeles, I got assigned after about six months, I got assigned to the Organized Crime Labor Racketeering Squad. And when I got there, we had an, another agent, Chuck McCormick, who had an informant by the name of Robert Kessler, who told him, if you have any trouble with the unions, I can help you with them. So Chuck said, what can we do to find out and have a union problem? Well, we thought if we started a company, you'd have to hire union drivers and run the company and do all that. And that's kind of would be too tough to do. And we didn't think that we'd get FBI approval for it. So he said, why don't we try a movie? you become me, meaning me, uh, become a movie producer and pretend that we're going to shoot a movie and we, where we have to go out and hire union drivers. Our u- movie would be a very low-budget, independent, where we wanted to go without union drivers. We said, well, we'll give that a shot. And we opened what we call a little group two uh, undercover operation, no big deal. We set up where I had a telephone set up in the New York office. The New York office helped us with a company that said they'd just verify me as being a, an investment broker who had a bunch of investors who wanted to do a little something, a little sexy, make a movie. And I came out to LA to look into it. And, but we only had a little over a million dollars to invest and it would have to be non-union. So Chuck McCormick's informant, Robert Kessler, set up a meeting with a fellow named Russ Massetta, who was a business agent for a local Teamsters union. And what we did is we rented a room in the Beverly Hills Hotel, hooked up cameras in it to record the meeting, and uh, Kessler set up the meeting, and I met with this Russ Massetta. And I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to shoot a non-union movie. And this movie was going to be done in Chicago. We didn't want to do it in L.A., but it was going to be done in Chicago. And we had a script, and we wanted to go from there. And I said, can you get help me? And he said, well, it's going to cost you. We, we were recording all this at the Beverly Hills Hotel. He said, here's what it's going to cost you. He said, it's going to cost you about $100,000. And I said, well, I'm not going to pay $100,000 right away, but here's what I'll do. I'll pay 25000 in advance, 50000 when we start shooting, and another 25000 when we com- uh, complete the movie. And we'd set up this scenario before with whoever we dealt with. And Russ Mastetta you know, thought about it, and he said, okay, that looks good. Let me get back to you. And he left the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel. So Chuck McCormick comes to me, and he says, listen, he says, you're here in the Beverly Hills Hotel. Why don't you call your wife up? Come on down. 
have dinner and stay in the Beverly Hills Hotel since we've already paid for the room. So I said, that's fine. I'll do that. So I called my wife, uh, Kathy. She drove down and we're eating dinner at the Beverly Hills Hotel in their restaurant. And Chuck McCormick comes running in and he's got panic all over his face. And he says, Russ Masetta has come back to the hotel to check on you. And he said, he's in the polo lounge. Why don't you just kind of finish your dinner and kind of meander in there and run into him in the the polo lounge? So I said, okay. And I said, Kathy, you're going to have to come in too. And she says, well, I'm not coming in right away. So I go in and I wander in there and I see Russ sitting at a table and uh, sit down with him. And then I tell him I'm with a girlfriend, you know, because I'm from New York and just out here in L.A. for to set this up. And I said, my girlfriend's going to come in in a minute. And we've taken our rings off. And so Kathy comes in there and we sat for two hours talking to Russ Massetta. My wife said afterwards, never get me involved in this again. I said, we couldn't help it. So she's practically undercover too. Exactly. Exactly. Her identity, she's she's cheating on herself because (laughs) she's played the role of your girlfriend girlfriend, instead of your wife. Uh, That's hilarious. Yeah. So after talking to him for two hours, it convinced him because he left. He says, hey, this all, everything sounds good, you know. And I'll get back to you. So he gets back to me and said, it's a go. And so he said, but I'm going to need a little bit of money in advance. So I ended up paying him $5,000 then. He had another meeting, which we recorded and everything. And then after that, he said, listen, um, our capo wants to meet you. He said, a fellow named Luigi Galfuso. And so we set up a meeting at a restaurant out in the valley. At this time, go back a little bit, I'm Garland Hoffner with Garman Productions is the name of the company we initially set up. So we're out in the valley. I'm sitting in a restaurant with Bob Kessler, the informant, and uh, in comes Luigi Galfuso with his kind of bodyguard, Albi Nunez. And Kessler sees him and he says, there he is. I'll go up there and, and greet him at the front of the restaurant. And so he goes up and they do this hugging with Albi Nunez and Luigi Del Fuso hugged uh, Kessler. And uh, I'm watching all this, and Kessler also kind of breaks away from him, comes back to me, sits down real quick, and says, and he's got sweat coming. It's in the summer, but he's got sweat coming off his face. And he says, uh, Albi Nunez thinks he felt something in my back. And we had him hooked up with a Nagra at the time of a recording device. And he says, I'm going to have to go outside and uh, So he goes out and uh, walks right past him, goes out, and he says, I'm going out to get a pack of cigarettes in in my car. He goes outside, and then I can hear on the, well, actually, later I hear when we we, uh, retrieve the nag right here, clump, 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 and then, because he had it tied around his chest, hooked her, and I hear the ripping sound, and he threw it in the dumpster and runs back to his car. And we had agents covering the meeting, and they're watching this outside, and they go, they, they walk, walk outside and they see him standing out by his car and they proceed to search him. They go up his pant legs and his chest and they open up the trunk of his car. They search his car. And he says, listen, I just came, went out to get a pack of cigarettes. And luckily he had a new, you know, fresh pack of cigarettes. They sitting out there, out there talking to him and searching him. And so, so uh, who, FBI agents? Are- no, no. A- agents who are covering the meeting uh, with uh, me and Gelfuso, they're seeing this going on outside where they're searching Kessler looking for it because they think they felt a wire when he walked in the restaurant and they hugged him. And so they're now outside searching him, looking for a wire. Kessler tells me later, he says, Gelfuso is saying, hey, I don't think he was wearing a wire. He, we can't find anything on him. And Albi Noon has just saying, I've definitely felt something. And so Gelfuso is so uh, greedy, he walks back in the, comes back into the restaurant and walks up to me and he said, do you have the money? Because I'm supposed to make a payoff to him. And I take the money out of my pocket. I was wearing a sport coat, pull it out of my pocket. I handed it to him and he walks out with the money. And that convicted him when he took the money. If he had walked away from it, he would have been, home free of having not taken a bribe or anything. 
So the Nagra, the recording device, was was actually taped to his back. So back, yeah. So they actually did feel they it. They felt it, but he when he ran out, he ripped it off his chest. It was, you know, he was just wearing a little sports shirt, and he just reached underneath it, pulled it off, and threw it in the dumpster, which we retrieved afterwards. How was he able to pull it off before they caught up to him to frisk him? Well, the restaurant uh, where I was sitting was in toward the back of the restaurant. And he said, hey, I've got to go to the restroom. And he got up. I mean, he told me. And they were, you know, they're sitting toward the front, but it's, you know, they're standing toward the front. But they didn't go immediately out. He just kind of walked past them and said, hey, I'm going to get some cigarettes. And I guess they sat there and they talked a few minutes. And then they followed him outside. And the dumpster was just right there around the corner. He tore it off, threw it in, and then walked to his car. And they caught him at the car. And he said, hey, I just came out for a pack of cigarettes. And he got the cigarettes out of the glove compartment. And then they started searching him. But they couldn't find anything. And Delfuso had done business with, they'd done business with Kester many times in the past. And so he didn't know whether to trust him or not. And we also had wires up in Gelfuso's house we had installed. Uh, and they got back there and they talked about it later about what they should do. Should they kill Kessler? I mean, they even talked about killing him. But they didn't because Gelfuso kept saying, hey, I know he's, uh, you know, he couldn't be, uh, you know, an informant because I've done so much business with him in the past. I would have gone to jail years ago. And so we got, had all this on recording. And the parking lot scenario, was that also recorded? Were there no, agents no, watching? No, no, no. The agents watching, that was recorded. They did, you know, 302s and everything on the, those are written. And they wrote it up of what they observed about him being searched and everything. But as a result of this, they never trusted Kessler again, and they broke off all contact. And so basically, it was closed down in L.A. We had a payment to uh, Russ Massetta. We had a payment to Galfuso. And uh, we took it to a grand jury and got a sealed indictment against those two, which we held on to. And so we said, this would work so well. I mean, God, this thing worked like a charm. And this is in late 1980s. We decided this went so well. Uh, let's take it to other offices, see if anybody else has any probable cause. And so we sent teletypes off, out to several offices, and the Boston field office responded. And they said they had a caterer who was doing, uh, uh, it was, they were doing the show Spencer for Hire, a TV show that they recorded a lot in Boston. And he said that he, uh, in order to do the catering, he had to pay off the te Teamsters to bring his truck on the lot, you know, on the movie lot. And we had interviewed him, a couple other people uh, that said that they had one of them, a company that would produce the rain when they had rain on the show and they needed rain and wind and so forth they had to pay in order to bring their equipment on the set. So we sent the teletype. Boston responded and said, why don't you give a shot here? So we then went, decided we're going to have to do a little bit more. We went back to FBI headquarters and went from a group two to a group one, where we'd have permission to set up an off-site movie company uh, offices for myself with a secretary and uh, various things like that to give us some credence if somebody decided to really check on us. So we set that up, and then I flew into Boston. I met with Jim Moore and Billy Wynn, and I told them that I was tr trying to shoot a, a non-union movie, and the movie ended up with being one called Cartoons that we used as a script. And that's another little short story, but getting the script, we went to Paramount Studios, and they gave us one script that was terrible. We got rid of that, and I'll get into later where we get the cartoon script. But anyway, so I went and met with Jim Moore and Billy Wynn. Jim Moore was the president of the union, and Billy Wynn was kind of a business agent, hired drivers and transportation coordinator. But him and Jim Moore were tight together. Everything they did, they did together. So in the meeting with them, I told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to shoot nine union, and in so which I recorded this, these conversations, and they said, Listen, you're not going to shoot here. If you do try to shoot here, you're going to have to hire our drivers. If you don't, things will happen. You know, and they hinted at things. There'll be a lot of noise on the set. Uh, trucks will come by. People will be yelling and screaming in the background. We, but if you shoot Union, we can guarantee no interference 
But if we're not there, there, we can't guarantee there won't be any interference when you shoot. So it was definitely a threat. Uh, yeah. Definitely a threat. Yeah, we're going to mess up your movie and not and not let you film it. If you film don't. it, right. You'll have right. problems. Your trucks will break down. You'll get flat time. And you say, you know, the trucks can get lost along the way. Uh, trucks will break down. There's just general things that we can guarantee won't happen. So at this time, we didn't have a source in Boston. I just got to, I was hoping we'd go in there. I'd meet with them. I'd say, here, you know, I'd kind of hint about some money. You can't overtly offer them money. They have to make the offer like uh, Russ Massetta did back in L.A. He said, hey, here's what it's going to cost you if you want to shoot. They didn't say anything like that. They just said, you're going to have to hire drivers. About a month later, the Boston office came up with an informant, a fellow named Robert Frankie, who was tight with two uh, mob guys, Tommy Hillary, and Dennis Lepore, Dennis Champagne Lepore. Yeah, he, that was his nickname, Dennis Champagne Lepore. He liked to drink expensive champagne. So okay. anyway. Well you, well, you know, I expected someone to have a, a nickname because yeah. <laughs> you know, isn't that how it is on TV and movies? All of the mobsters yeah, have right, some type yeah, of a yeah. nickname? Yeah, yeah. So he does. He's Champagne Lepore. Robert Frankie had been real tight with them, and he got into gambling debts. And he fled Boston and came out to L.A. And he wanted nothing to do with them. But they went to his mother and they talked to his mother and it kind of threatened his mother. And so he then got in contact with the Boston office and said, listen, these two guys have threatened me. They want me to come work for them, dealing some drugs, getting drugs and things for them. The Boston office then said, hey, why don't you come work for us? And he said he would. And since he was out in L.A., they put uh, Frankie in touch with our L.A. office. And since we were the O.C. crime squad, uh, Frankie started working for us. And he's in contact back and forth because he's doing some drugs for them, for Tommy Hillary and uh, Dennis Lepore. And just in general conversations, we, uh, Frankie says to him, Hey, do you, you know, we got a, I've got to know some guys that are a guy that wants to make a movie and they, they want to shoot it there in Boston. Uh, can you guys help me? And they say, Yeah, we can handle the unions for you. No problem whatsoever. We can take care of the unions. So Frankie set up a meeting with me, with uh, Dennis Lepore and Tommy Hillary. Now, Tommy Hillary's father, was the driver for Raymond Patriarca when he was the head of the Boston mob back in the early 80s and before Raymond Patriarca Jr. took over. But his father, Tommy Hillary's father, drove for Raymond Patriarca Sr. And he had kind of uh, adopted Thomas Hillary. I mean, Thomas Hillary was real close with Jr. They were like brothers. And he's running around with this Dennis Lepore. And they're just doing different things some drugs and other, they would also, he, later on when I got tight with them, told me they would extort money from the Chinese who were in the Chinese section of Boston, the business and so forth for protection. And that's how they got some, one of the ways they got their money also. They'd make monthly collections <clears throat> and they turned their money over to now, if I'm going too fast, a fellow named Frank Salemi Sr., who is head, head of the family now. Just to give you a little history on Hillary and Laporte, get back to the story. We they set up a meeting. They told me to come to Boston, and I checked into the Bostonian Hotel in Boston, which is a nice, ritzy hotel because I'm a movie producer. At the same time, back in L.A., I'm driving a Rolls Royce. I fly into Boston. They send a guy to come pick me up at the hotel, and when he comes in, he takes me to the hotel, to the restaurant. They take me into the bathroom and they completely search me and everything. And then we sit down and start talking. I tell them what I want. And Hillary and uh, Lepore say, hey, we can handle it for you. We can take care of the unions. Let me interrupt you because, of course, normally in that type of undercover situation, you would be wired. You know, you would have a recorder on you. Did you? And they didn't find it. Was it a transmitter? Or did you just figure out, at least at this initial meeting, you should not have any type of uh, recording device on your person? Yeah, we decided that the first meeting, we wouldn't take that opportunity to record. The source had told us there's a good chance that they might search him. 
So we decided we wouldn't do it on this initial meeting. So when I met with them, uh, like I said, they took me in and they searched me in the bathroom. And then we came out and sat a nice dinner and went through the same scenario that I did with the Russ Masetta. They said, how much it's going to cost? here's what it's going to cost you. And I said, here's what I'm willing to pay. And we negotiated back and forth. And I gave them the same thing, 25, 50, 25 at the completion. So they said, okay, you leave. We've got to talk to some other people and we'll get back in touch with you. Go back to LA. So after a couple of weeks, I get another call and they say, come on back to Boston. We're going to uh, have another meeting. So this time we met, uh, I get to the, my hotel at the Bostonian Hotel. And I get a call from them, say, come straight out. Don't go anywhere else. Come straight out to the Marriott Cambridge. And we're sitting outside and we're doing the same. We're talking. They say, we've got everything approved. Everything's going to be fine. We've got it set up with the Teamsters. And uh, I told them I'm going to have to meet with the Teamsters for that assurances. And then Hillary makes the surveillance. The FBI in Boston is surveilling the meeting because they want to see who Hillary goes and uh, Lepore go to see after they've met with me. And they're using a truck. And Hillary is a pretty smart guy. I know he thinks he sees it, knows he sees it. Uh, he's not positive he sees the surveillance. But he tells me, get up. We're leaving the meeting right now. And they, we run into, we go into the hotel they take me into the bathroom. They search me again briefly. Luckily, I'm not wearing a wire for this meeting either. They say, go back to the hotel. Everything's off. We'll get and hold of you later if we're going to do anything. And they shut everything down. Meanwhile, three months pass. Frankie's in contact with them. And they're trying to decide whether I was a cop and everything. And Hillary has got an ego. And he's saying, he's saying I don't think it was him. And uh, they had actually called me one other time immediately afterwards. They called me after I went back to the hotel and said, going back to L.A., everything's closed. I said, listen, I'm not a cop. I'm telling them. I said, I got your call from the hotel. It took me 15 minutes in a camp to get out to the Cambridge Marriott. I said, how would I, if I was a cop, set up a surveillance of you and everything like that? And Hillary has got an ego. And he says, you know, I'm so well known in this city. They're probably, they're always following me around. But he still, they break off contact for three months. And we get a call. I get a call from Frankie. And he said, listen, they're sending Champagne Dennis Lepore out to see you. Dennis Lepore, Hillary and Lepore, the two mob guys I'm dealing with. So anyway, he comes out without me supposing to know. We've got our off-site set up. He comes walking in off the street like he just flew into you know, L.A. He to check on me to see if I'm legit. And he and we, uh, the offsite we have hooked up with the cameras and everything. And he comes uh, in and he sits down with me and we're recording everything. And uh, he says, Let's, you know, let's go out to dinner tonight. So I took him out to a fancy restaurant where he ordered the expensive champagne. And then the next day he comes over and we record him again. And he says, Look, he now believes I'm who I am. And he says, you know, I needed some, uh, you need to pay me at least some money. And I said, well, I'll pay you $5,000. So I had $5,000 in the office and I paid him $5,000. And that essentially uh, convicted him. So we're now back in business, back in business. But they've decided that uh, Champagne Laporte is out of the picture. And I'm not knowing this, but they've got, they want me to meet another fellow. And this is Frank Salemi, but he's going by the name of Frank Sacco. And Tommy Hillary is going by the name of Fields, last name Fields. And so they set up a meeting with me with because they uh, Hillary has told me Salemi is the son of the boss. He's Frank Sacco to me, not Frank Salemi. And Hillary is still Fields. And they said, let's, we're going to meet in Las Vegas. And so I fly into Las Vegas. Frankie's comes, comes with me. And so does, uh, Hillary and Salemi, and we meet, I meet uh, Salemi for the first time in Las Vegas. And we go out to a restaurant that's kind of not, a, uh, the guy that owns it is just kind of a friend of the mob guys. And so we're having dinner and, and I meet the, the, the restaurant owner and Hillary introduces me to him and we talk and spend the whole evening talking together. And the guy, uh, the owner of the restaurant has got a son 
that wants to get in the movies. So, and I said, well, I can't do any business with you now. So I gave him my LA phone number and I said, call me when I get back to LA. So the meeting with Salemi went over real well. And I fly back to LA. They go back to uh, Boston. And so we set up another meeting where I'm to fly back into Boston to meet with them again. Salemi is, you know, is Sacco. It's now Sacco and Fields. It's uh, Hillary is still Fields. At this time, I'm also, because we're a full production, I've hired this fellow, George Moffley, to be my production manager. We're going to look for offices in Providence to set up for the movie. And so... Now, is he is he an undercover agent, too? No, no. He's like, I'm hiring people off the oh, street really? now. You're, yeah. So you're really trying to look legit by legit. hiring people in the business. Right. In, the in fact, yeah. In fact, Moffley... I had was from Boston originally, and I uh, we'd run ads in the uh, Hollywood Reporter, and uh, saying that we were looking for people to you know to hire for our production company. It was David Rudder Productions, and he had come and I'd interviewed him, and he said he knew people in Boston and so forth. He from Boston, and he could help me with the uh, different people there. So you know, with the film commission and so forth, and also for locations and things for our shooting. So we fly to Boston and we fly into Providence. And when I get to Providence, here is Frank Salemi, Tommy Hillary, Dennis Lepore is no longer there, but, uh, and, and a couple other mob guys out of Providence in the, with the family. And I'm being introduced to them. And I'm also, I'm introducing George Moffley to them. And I, I know, and I, I make the mistake and I say, George, I want you to meet Tommy Hillary. And they hadn't told me he was Hillary. And I go walking off and I've introduced, I still introduce Frank Salemi as Frank Sacco. And uh, I go walking because I'm going back to the hotel, George, um, the hotel from the airport. And George Moffley is with me and Frankie comes up to me and he says, what did you do? You screwed this whole thing up. You introduced Tommy Hillary as Tommy Hillary when he's really, you know, pretending he's Fields, Tommy Fields. Luckily, the restaurant owner in Las Vegas had called me up and he said, hey, you know, I just, uh, Tommy Hillary introduced me to you and the, the restaurant when you had, we had dinner together and I'd like to get my son in the movies too. And I said, I, he can send a picture. And I, we worked out a deal who's going to send me pictures of his son. But if I hadn't remembered that, that he had introduced, uh, he said, Tommy Hillary to me. So I told Frankie, Tom, hey, the guy out in Las Vegas, the owner of the restaurant in Las Vegas, uh, told me that Fields' name was Tommy Hillary. Uh, and so we, we talked about Hillary all the time there. And he told me all about it. And so Frankie goes back and tells Hillary this. And Hillary calls out to Las Vegas to check on it. And the guy verified that he had told me that Fields was Tommy Hillary. So we got over that hurdle. So now, wow, you were lucky. Very, you know, we were very lucky. lucky a couple of times. We made the surveillance. Uh, the, uh, of course, the Kessler thing with the, back in uh, L.A. And uh, that just tells you how greedy they were. They, you know, yeah, how have, desperate they were to to, yeah. to take your money. Yeah, and so as a result of this, Frank Salemi dropped the sacco. He became Salemi to me, and we hence. We had some more meetings, one another one in Las Vegas, and we and he's working the things out with the Teamsters. And so he finally got a meeting. He got a, me a meeting. I told him we came uh, when we came into uh, Boston the next time. He got me a meeting with Moore and Wynn, where they told me you can shoot non-union. And so as a result of that, right after that meeting, Salemi was waiting for me in a hotel room next to the hotel I was staying in because uh, we met in Cambridge again. And they said, yeah, you've got to make a payment. They want to $25,000. So uh, I gave Frankie twenty five, dollars uh, but he said, you're not going to go with me to make the payment, but Frankie will. And so Frankie and Salami drove out to where Billy Wynn was, uh, was doing the movie. I forget the, the name of a movie was Cher. That was the mermaid movie, the mermaids. And so he, they went and they paid uh, Wynn the money. Frankie went with Salemi when they paid off Billy Wynn. But we never had Jimmy Moore actually getting the money. Seeing Jimmy Moore receive the money, but we assume Wynn gave uh, Moore a cut. 
but we never had anything that showing that Moore actually got money. So we got him giving Moore actually, because he was the president, giving me the assurances that we could shoot non-union. All we had was that, but we didn't have anything else, uh, an actual money payment. But we had now, we have Slim and everybody. And we've got Tommy Hillary and we got Frank Salemi. We set up production offices, casting out in LA for the movie parts. We had done some hiring in Boston. We had hired construction coordinator, art director, had about hired about 14 people. This was the first FBI case, undercover case, where the undercover of the people that we hired did not know that we were FBI. We're hiring completely people that think they're going to go work for a legitimate company. In fact, we were paying them on a weekly basis. We had found production offices in Providence. And in order to do this, we every six months, you have to go back to headquarters and where the, to get the undercover of one operation approved and get money. And we'd gone back and had a meeting and the Justice Department had come over and we told them we to make ourselves legitimate so we could make more payments that uh, we wanted to set up the offices and actual film a movie. And we had gotten approval and they'd given us, and I told them, you know, we need $1.3 million. And they said, okay, we're going to give you $600,000 in advance. And they gave us the money for it and to put it in a bank account where we had the money so we could hire these people and start paying. And one of the two of the people we had hired, I had hired, who came to me because the script we had called The Knockdown was so bad. We got this one called Cartoons. It was two young guys named Dan, Luke, and Gary Levy. Really nice kids. They had written this script. They had done a little short that they showed me. It was really good. And they, I said, Dan, oh, these, these, and they, this was their break. They'd taken the movie Cartoons to various studios and been turned down. And so I'm, I, start, I'm starting to feel sorry for them. I did too. So anyway, we got an approval all the way up to an assistant director in the FBI and plus the Justice Department with the undercover operations. Our argument was we're hiring these people like the actors, you know, for six weeks. We had storyboards, how it was all lined up. We'd done location shooting, places we were going to shoot. We'd done a lot of the preliminary work. We were looking, starting to hire. We were going to hire actors and we said, we're going to hire them for six weeks. We're going to pay them the least amount we could. We'd pay them. And once the movie was done, they were going to be happy. They've been paid. Uh, we're not going to give them points or anything like that. So if the movie makes money, they're going to get extra money if it does well. And so they had approved it. They said it shouldn't be a problem legally. They got paid for their work. If the, you know, the movie will probably never be released. Uh, if it is, so I mean, I'm saying the release, maybe we will make some money. But anyway, we were set to make the movie. And so I'd come flying, I'm flying back and forth to Providence in Boston and so forth. And I came back to this Providence and George Moffley had hired all these people, Dan, Luke, and uh, Gary Levy. I'd get paid them $25,000 for option for their movie, for their script and everything. Because we had also, I'd also hired an attorney out in uh, LA to help us uh, from Columbia Pictures who's an attorney for Columbia that said he'd help us too with the legal aspects of it, contracts. Did he know who you really were? The attorney? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, we had told him. We had told him. Okay. He, he was kind of a contact in the FBI. And so he was going to help us with all the handling, all the contracts. And we were, and I was paying George Moffley so much a, uh, a week and these other people we had hired. And I'm back in the, Back in Providence, this is after we've gotten the approval, the money's in the bank, and Group 1 approval, and I'm sitting there in the office, and I got a call from FBI headquarters on the phone, and they say, we're shutting you down. They had gone up high. I don't know who they were. I never knew who they went to, but we would had a deputy AD giving us approval in the undercover meeting, whether it was an uh, assistant director or it went all the way to the director. I, they never told me, but they said, we're shutting it down. And I heard later on, they said, we're shutting it down now because we just think it's too expensive, decided we don't want to do it. And the reason we had decided to actually make the movie, even though we'd made some payoffs, was that Salemi said that you can, you can take this, we can go all over the country. 
making movies. And I said I had a couple other movies. One of them was one uh, that we were going to do in Las Vegas, another one we were going to do in Chicago, and also in New York. And he said, we can take care of everything for you. We told, this is what we told the Bureau uh, when we got the initial approval. After we do this, we'll go to other cities and do the same thing. But they shut it down. And so I had to call the, uh, Gary uh, Levy and Dan Luke in to the office and tell them my investors decided to back out. We're shutting the thing down. I told George Moffley the same thing. You have to tell all the people you've hired, construction coordinator, the art director, and these about 10 other people, cancel our month-to-month lease on the production offices, which we'd rented for six weeks, and uh, shut everything down. And so it broke, uh, it broke leaving. And they didn't, we hadn't told anybody that say, you know, we're FBI. I just said, we're shutting down. Uh, no more money. I've got a, sh- you know, I've paid you guys, uh, but I wish we could have gone ahead and bought the, uh, you know, the script from you. And, but, uh, you've got to, we'll get, I'm giving you the script back. We're not taking the, the option and you can try to peddle it somewhere else. They must have been devastated. They were this, devastated. This they, was were gonna be, yeah. they were going to be break. Yeah, they were going to be co-directors, and uh, we shut it down. It broke their hearts. That basically ended the case. We're shut down. We're not going anywhere else. We made some overtures in Las Vegas. Been out to Las Vegas and met with the both the IOTC people, that's the electrical workers and so forth, the below the line people and the teamsters. I heard that the Teamsters said when they, Salemi and Wynn met with the Teamsters, they said, hey, if you don't have any money in uh, Boston, how in the hell are you going to shoot a movie in Las Vegas? So they wouldn't really have anything to do with it. And that ended the whole thing. Because we had, I mean, just a ton of tapes. It took a couple years to listen to all the tapes and everything. And uh, the attorney in Boston, Fred Wyshack, was an excellent attorney. Him and uh, Brian Kelly prosecuted the case. They took it to the grand jury. They got uh, indictments against Moore, Wynn, Salemi, Lepore, Hillary. And then we went to trial. And we went to trial at this time. Frank Salemi is sick. He couldn't join the trial. He had AIDS. He used to go see the prostitutes and everything all the time. Lepore pled guilty. Hillary pled guilty and went to jail and then became a cooperating witness and ended up testifying against Wynn and Moore. Frankie testified. He went into the witness protection program. Uh, Hillary went into the witness protection program. We convicted Wynn and didn't convict Moore. So uh, that's where it ended. We would have, uh, Salemi ended up dying before he could go to trial. During that interim, we were listening to tapes. We shut it down and uh, uh, Fred Wyshack got the indictment. And uh, I mean, the indictment, we went to trial, as I said, and convicted uh, uh, when, when Moore was acquitted. Uh, I think he was guilty, but that was his uh, opinion. And we didn't have any direct payoffs to him. We had the payoffs to win. We had payoffs to Salemi. And like I say, Hillary pled guilty. Dennis Lepore pled guilty. Lepore went to jail for five years. Hillary went to jail for a couple of years and then went into the witness pro- protection program when he got out. So did uh, Robert Frankie. I would talk to Hillary and Salemi and then they would talk to me about, you know, what they did to make money with hard times. They say one of their easiest money maker was selling drugs to college. You know, they've got so many universities in Boston selling drugs to the college kids. And what they would do, they would uh, set up a meet to sell drugs. Meet them in an alley or meet them in a, inside an uh, apartment building. The college kids would get their money out, and they'd just say, we'll see you. They'd pull a gun on them and said, thank you. They'd take their money, and they'd stiff them. They'd say, knowing that the kids would not go to the police because they were trying to buy drugs. <laughs> so, so they never had any drugs to sell them in the first place. They had business. drugs. They, they would sell that. It was a side, but a lot of the times, they'd just rip off the college kids. They had other avenues where they sold drugs to people that worked for them would sell them on the street but they did they would occasionally they said when we really were hard up for money we just go uh, rip off some college kid you know the the college kids got a little bit of an education there yes they did the other thing that salimi told me salimi said occasionally you know around christmas time if i'm short of, short of money he said i'd go out and rob lobster boats <laughs> not lobster boats but lobster traps they get a boat and they go around and pull the traps, take the lobsters out, and then sell the lobsters for cash. And like Tommy Hillary, 
he never worked a day in his life. And that's the way Slammy was. They just, they would stand around the corners or whatever they did, but they didn't work. They just used their schemes. Hillary told me later after he, you know, decided to cooperate, he said the biggest mistake he ever made in his life, he said when Raymond Patriarca set him up, he was married at the time, set him up with a jewelry shop selling costume jewelry in a, in a uh, Las Vegas casino. He had a little shop outside the casino, but, you know, in the mall where the casino was and so forth. And he said, uh, set my wife and I up with a jewelry shop. And they supplied all the jewelry, uh, the patriarchal family, because Providence was big for costume jewelry and so forth. And he said, what I did is I made the biggest mistake in my life. I took that store into bankruptcy. Uh, they bring the goods in. I'd bring them out the back door. I'd sell them off cheap. I wouldn't pay my debts. And then I'd have to uh, declare bankruptcy. And he said, if I'd have kept that shop, I could have made money. I wouldn't have had to go and do all this crime stuff. His wife ended up divorcing him and went on with his life of crime. So until he got convicted and went into the witness protection program. So that basically ended the undercover operation. Uh, like I say, I never really knew, but I heard that the reason they shut the thing down at headquarters was because they were afraid, the headquarters was afraid that once it got out, if we actually made a movie and hired these people and they found out that they were working for the FBI, it would be bad publicity for the FBI. Now, whether that was true, that's just what I heard from people. The funny thing is that when the case became known, it still got a lot of publicity. It did. Publicity. I, I was reading some of the articles. People were absolutely mesmerized by the concept of the case. I mean, it's really something different. And there were a lot of articles to the point where, was it the original screenwriters that, that wrote the screenplay for the movie? I mean, who wrote the last mm -hmm. shot? That that wasn't Levy or Luke. They had nothing to do with that. Ah, uh, see, that's where they should have capitalized. Well, on it. where they did capitalize, they just like when they did the movie, I got paid, and they also paid them. The uh, studio uh, Disney paid them for their rights to the movie, so they got they got some money for that. They never told. I know how much I got for it. I I think they told me uh, what they got for it, and they did okay. They did okay. I couldn't tell you the exact figure, but it was over uh, $100,000, a little bit over that. You know. Yeah, but I, I would think as filmmakers, their main thing that they wanted was to actually make they a wanted, they wanted their They wanted to direct, and they wanted their own script. And they, they, were, and they didn't, this didn't come out to several years later, when, not till 2000. Uh, we were done with the actual crimes and court cases in the early 90s. And uh, wasn't into 2000. The movie came out in 2005, I think right around 2005. But uh, they weren't contacted to, to about doing a movie till later. Not to, not to, did I actually ever meet with them and tell them until the article started coming out that I told them that I was uh, with the FBI. To, when I met with them and told them uh, I was with the FBI. And that, uh, what was their reaction? their reaction was, and I, they, they, this was before, you know, the movie, the movie deal came through and I told them that and they, uh, we, they were extremely upset about it. Uh, they thought they'd gotten the shaft and I didn't blame them, but they, you know, they took, you know, what else would they, you know, what else would they, could they do? But another in interesting aside from this whole thing, Frank Salemi Sr. was a very nasty guy. I saw him when he came, he came out with his son and had out to Los Angeles one time when I was meeting Salemi, but I didn't meet the father. He was a very nasty guy. And in fact, when he first, he went to jail for 13 years where he uh, got convicted and he blew the legs. He set a bomb in the prosecutor's car and tried to kill the prosecutor the case. Hey, let me ask you, the prosecutor was in the car. What, what happened to that prosecutor? He lost his legs, but he, had, so he survived. He lost his legs, but survived. Frank Sr. went to Waltham uh, State Penitentiary for 13 years before he got out. And then when he came out, he got, uh, he went, tried to take control of the Boston family, which he did, and he ended up in, in the fight for control. This is in the early 80s. He got uh, shot outside a restaurant, uh, I think it was, a, I forget the name of the restaurant, one of these pancake places. He got shot in the, uh, in the stomach. And when the police came, 
police came and said, well, I don't know who did it. I don't know. Who did it. Don't know anything. Nothing. They wouldn't, you know, though it was in the battle control over the, uh, the New England mob, which he took control of. And then he ended up Salemi, you know, when they had the, the Whitey Bulger case and all that with those people and uh, Salemi uh, got prosecuted and he cooperated to some degree, but he went to jail again and then got out of jail uh, just a few years ago from uh, helping the FBI. And he did some testifying, but not a whole lot. And I get a call. This is, you know, this is uh, when I finished with it in the early 90s, all the way till just last year, spring of last year. I got a call from Fred Wyshek, who's the uh, AUSA, Justice Department Strike Force attorney. He said, we're going to trial for murder on Frank Salemi Sr. And he said, we're using some tapes from your case. And one of them, the tape they were using was for was Ro, um, Robert Frankie, where he met with Frank Salemi Jr. And Frank Salemi Jr. said, my father and I are taking over a nightclub in Boston. And this is in the early 90s. They murdered Frank Salemi Sr. and Jr. and another fellow murdered the owner of this uh, nightclub. And they took over control of it. And the reason they came out just two years ago, a person got arrested who was there with him on the drug charges, and he did not want to go back to jail. And he testified. He said, I was present when Salemi Sr. and Salemi Jr. Uh, killed this guy, murdered this guy. They strangled him. They held him down and strangled him. And so Wyshak was using this tape to show that they had the interest in the restaurant and uh, to show uh, some motive for the killing of the person because they were taking over the restaurant from him. They ended up just convicted this past uh, last April, Frank Salemi Sr. for murder, and Jr. had died in the interim. Our case actually contributed to the conviction of Frank Salemi Sr. 15 years later. But uh, Salemi, he was a nasty guy, nasty guy. Occasions, you know, every any time when you, and I was, and I was wearing a wire almost every time after the initial couple meetings. And every time, and several times, I, you know, when you would go out with them, you're always worried you're going to slip up, like I did with saying introducing Hillary as Hillary. And so you're under that constant pressure. And at the same time, you know, I'm meeting with them at night, most of the time, uh, or traveling to meet them and staying up late and uh, coming back to our offsite and listening to tapes and things like that. And it was trying in that respect because, uh, you know, I wasn't more just working an eight-hour day. I was, you know, a lot of times I was up to 12, 1, 2 o'clock with them or going places and with them all day and night. Like we went out on a trip to Las Vegas. We went to some fights out there and I'm with them the whole day. And then one time we're in a, a bar and uh, Evil Knievel was there and he came over and they introduced me to Evil Knievel and different things like that. It was just different things that would happen with them were stressful. And another time that we're in Las Vegas, and uh, one of the guys was, uh, that I was with uh, was being harassed by some people. And uh, the mob guys, Robert Frankie, and, uh, went over to him and said, hey, you know, you, you know, threaten them a little bit. When I was dealing with the mob guys, they were there strictly for the money. Uh, and one of the comments that Frank Salemi made to me, he said, if you're a cop, he said, we're going to be in the Cold Bar Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> meaning the jail. So that's what they call jail, the cold bar hotel. I like that. And, yeah. And even after it was over, I ran into him, uh, uh, Salemi, you know, when we were doing the preliminary hearings on the trial, and he attended those before he got dropped from the case because he got sick. I ran into him in the elevator, and he just said, hi, how you doing? Uh, he didn't, uh, you know, act threatening to me. And even though my name became known uh, when the trial, I was never worried they would take action against me because I was FBI. You know, they were going to go to the Cold Bar Hotel and they weren't going to do anything to me. Now, with Frankie and Hillary, uh, they would have killed them because Hillary was so close because Frank Salemi Sr., when we had these little tie-ups, you know, where uh, they thought maybe I might be a cop. Frank Salemi Sr. had told Hillary, if you're bringing my son into something, we're gonna, we'll kill you. We'll kill you. This better be legit. This better not be anything that gets him into trouble. 
Uh, Hillary went into the witness protection program. And for a number of years, I stayed in contact with Hillary or Hillary stayed. He would call me because he still had the number. He'd call you and I'd see, I asked how he was doing, but I haven't uh, talked to him in several years now. Why do you think he wanted to keep that connection with you? We got along, you know, we got along. He, uh, uh, in preparation for the trial, like the trial was like six weeks. And we were back there in Boston together during the trial. Also, and after, during all the preparation, preliminary hearings and so forth, we got along very well. And the other case agent, the case agent, Bill Fleming, he got along with him, which who did a hell of a job. I want to give him credit, who was a case agent to travel with me a lot of the times. Uh, when I was meeting, he would travel. We'd travel on different flights and so forth and stay in different hotels. But he was the one that would wire me up when I went on the uh, the meetings and so forth and uh, take the wire off of you when I came back. And uh, and then we'd discuss what would happened and we reviewed all the tapes for the trial, and which took a, a long time. And uh, so, uh, you know, Bill Fleming was uh, the main thing that pushed the case along from the beginning. Uh, and had the experience. But anyway, we've completed the case. Several years pass. And then I get a call from this Elizabeth Gilbert. I don't know if you I sent that article to you. She she wrote the book, Eat, Pray, and Love. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I did she know was a, Yeah, she was a writer for you. Real nice. She came out and interviewed me with George Moffley. And she wrote the article that was in GQ magazine in their March edition, their Hollywood edition. It started the interest. And I got contacted by Columbia and Disney to make a movie. They said they would like to do a movie. It's going to be kind of a serious uh, comedy. And uh, uh, I met and interviewed the writer, interviewed him, and they said they would pay me. We signed some contracts and uh, where they would pay me. I met with the writer of the movie. He was the same guy that wrote uh, Catch Me If You Can, you know, the FBI movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can, the guy that uh, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio played him. He had yeah, written the script Tom for Hanks, that. Tom, yeah, Tom well, yeah. was the FBI. He had, he had written that script for that movie, and he wrote the script for this one, for uh, for The Last Shot. And they ended up hiring, like I say, Alec Baldwin to play me, Matthew Broderick to play one of the writers, and his uh, another fella. We had Calista Flockhart, Joan Cusack. Tony Gillette, I don't know if you remember, you know her. She was Little Miss Sunshine, the mother in Little Miss Sunshine. She's been in a number of movies. Had a heck of a cast. And it follows the story of our case very closely. We kind of made it a comedy. All the, the payoffs and the things like that and with the mob and everything and shooting it in Boston. And uh, the original cartoons were supposed to be shot in the desert. But uh uh, we switched, changed it. They got to Luke and Levy to change it to Boston. And so uh, they went ahead and did the movie, and it was was a pretty good movie. The only problem was when the movie came out, they released it in seven theaters nationwide, in uh, major theaters, Boston, New York, I think, Los Angeles, Chicago, I forget, New York, but so, only seven st- cities. And they didn't give it any publicity. So it became real popular on cable. And the reason they didn't is because this was at the time that Disney was undergoing an overthrow or a, the removal of the head of the motion picture studio division. He was leaving the show and the new guy did not want to put any money into something that the person that he was succeeding had recommended or pushed because that would be no credit for him. He wanted to do is have his own movies released, not the other guy's movies. So they, they released it, didn't give it any publicity, and it was opened. It was opened in seven theaters, and you know was there a couple of weeks, and then it, it, they didn't expand and release it to many theaters. And so that's what happened to it. It went to cable. It was successful. Still, you can get it on Netflix, and uh, it's a popular movie on cable. And I admitted this to you when we started recording that I forgot to watch it. You know, I I always prepare for all of my uh, interviews and I read up and I look at all the articles and do all the stuff. And I completely forgot about the movie to watch it last night. But I am going to watch it this weekend. But you watched it. And so you feel that they did a good job. They turned it into a uh, kind of a comedy. But soon they made it like, you know, that I was really wanted to shoot the movie, you know, which I did. 
but sitting in a movie theater at the end of the thing and saying, and I'm meeting the meeting one of the guys, writers, and they're saying, you know, could really go in somewhere with this. But uh, they opened the movie with me undercover in another case, getting my fingers chopped off by the bad guys. But I mean, they took some license. And I'm always having trouble with headquarters about, which I did have a little trouble with headquarters, making a movie and how I, I became a movie guy and not an F, you know, really wanting to be an FBI agent, you know, that type of comedy type thing. So, 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 they, took, far, they took a little dramatic license. Yeah, right. But as far as following the theme, the theme of paying off the Teamsters and so forth, and they ended the movie with a big raid shooting the movie we've got the movie actors and here comes the fbi and helicopters swooping down and arresting tony shalhoub and uh you know these other guys with a whole bunch of crew of fbi agents that's how they uh, ended it which didn't happen that way we just got indictments and then uh, they went to trial but it wasn't a big raid or anything like that so well at the end of most of my episodes i try to review a book, a crime novel, or a crime drama. So since I haven't watched the movie yet, then at the end of this episode will be my opportunity to talk about what I thought about the movie, because I'll definitely watch it before this episode is posted. But it's good to know that even with all the changes that they made, that you still enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. It was was a fun experience, uh, the whole thing. This has been a great case review, especially, you know, the connection it had to the movie. But let's hear your story. When did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? Well, I, I joined in 1965 when I graduated from law school at American University, Washington College of Law. I went to GWU undergrad and then uh, straight into law school. When I got out of law school, my father had close family friends that was an FBI agent, went to the same church we went to. During my senior year in law school, he said, why don't you apply to the FBI? He said, you can do it. And I said, well, I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And I really didn't want to practice law. So I applied to the FBI and got in the FBI. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll stay three years and see how I like it. And if I don't like it, I'll, you know, maybe do something in the law. My father was a lawyer. But I like what I was doing. I went to Detroit, my first office. I worked fugitives and uh, bank robberies. And uh, about every uh, day you're out there looking for a fugitive. You used to keep track of how many people you arrested and like in the case number for our performance reports. And like in that one year, I was there 14 months and got transferred to Louisville. In that 14 months, I arrested, made 52 arrests, myself and my partner. Yeah, you guys were busy. Yeah, we had, it was a great, they were all 88s and 76s. I mean, you know, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution and, you know, and then the uh, escape federal prisoner and probation and violations and so forth, parole violations. Did you retire out of L.A.? Yeah, I retired out of L.A. And then after a year, 14 months, I went to Louisville for seven months, then to Houston for two years, then to Cincinnati for six years. Then back to headquarters in FOIPA as a supervisor. One year. That's uh, the, that's the I, I had to do the acronym. That's the Freedom of Information. Information Privacy. Act. Yeah. Worked there for four years. Went out on inspection for a year. Then came out to L.A. as a supervisor of the copyright squad for a year. And then they asked me if I wanted to go back to headquarters as a unit chief. And I did at the time because my wife had just got accepted to medical school at the University of Louisville. And it was too hard to make the commute. It had been easy from Washington. So I went back and did four more years in FOIPA as a unit chief. Uh, when I finished that, I, my wife got a residency in UCLA. I was in the executive go up the ladder. I was set to go out as an ASAC. Went back to that executive training school for a couple of weeks and uh, did that. And I was ready to go out as an ace tech. And I said, I'm going to step down because my wife was doing a residency in Los Angeles. So I went back out on the street as a street agent. And then I got on the OC squad and stayed for 14 years until I retired in uh, 1998. Stepping off the ladder certainly worked out well oh, yeah. for you. Oh, yeah. I was glad to do it. So what did you do after you retired from the... FBI. Mm-hmm. I retired. Oh, good for you. Most, <laughs> I most people, yeah, most people don't. <laughs> I decided I, I didn't want to work anymore. I had young children, one daughter at the time when I retired that was uh, 
11 and another one seven. And they were in private school, going to school. And so I'm helping them with their work and picking them up from school and things like that and taking them to school. So that kept me busy. And then the consulting with this movie was took a couple of years. And, uh, but I never went back to work. I'm happy about that. Well, I always like to give my guests the last word. That way I know for sure that if I forgot to ask them something or they wanted to say anything, that they have the opportunity. So the last word is yours. I can't think of anything else right now other than to say that uh, everything worked out well with the case. Why Shaq and Brian Kelly, they did a heck of a job with prosecuting the mob in Boston. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Garland Swikart. You'll find links to newspaper articles about the case. I've included the movie posters for the film, The Last Shot, and a link to the movie trailer. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them listen to the post on my website, how to listen to a podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or anywhere you listen to audio. My crime drama recommendation for you today is The Last Shot, the movie about Garland Swikart's real life FBI undercover sting. Now, the way I look at it, any movie starring Alec Baldwin and Matthew Broderick is going to be good, and this one certainly was. It is definitely a comedy and not a true drama. It is packed with well-known stars, lots of car chases, and action scenes. Now, if I wanted to critique this movie based on my 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI, I would probably have a complete dissertation. But it's the kind of movie that you throw all of that out of the window and just have a good time. So I definitely recommend the crime dramedy, The Last Shot. Soon you'll be able to pick up a copy of my first nonfiction book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. Coming soon to all stores where books are sold. It's a 55,000 word expanded version of my popular FBI reality checklist. If you enjoy police procedurals, I hope you also consider picking up copies of the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. The crime fiction series features Special Agent Carrie Wheeler, Temptation, Corruption, and Redemption. The books are available as ebooks and paperbacks at Amazon.com, and Pay to Play is also an audiobook. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.